Good morning. Good to see everyone with us today. We do continue want to remember our, our sick who are dealing with different issues, Gary, as well as several others dealing with COVID. Let's keep them in our prayers. We are thankful that we have an opportunity to be out here in the presence of God and worship Him. You would be turning your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Ezekiel chapter 14, we'll look at verses 3 and 4, not 13 and 14. Ezekiel 14, verses 3 and 4. The lesson we're going to look at today is based on this verse, and it's about idols in the heart. Look at verse 3 of Ezekiel 14, we can read, Son of man... These men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired at all by them? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I the Lord will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. Now he's telling us that these people had set up idols in their hearts and committed a great evil of that day by doing so. It is suggestive of that golden calf worship that we read that Israel did when Aaron formed that golden calf, and we'll notice that just a little bit later on. But God said in verse 4, or Ezekiel's writing that God's saying, I'm going to be the one to deal with this, and I'll take care of it. So we need to remember that when we're living upon this earth, we've got to answer to God for what we do. And there are those who, in Ezekiel's day, had idols in their hearts. And as a result of it, he said, God's going to answer you and God's going to judge you. Just as they had that idol worship, we can establish idols in our own heart. And we have to be careful in our lives that when we live here that we're not establishing those idols. We're not doing those things that we shouldn't be doing because God's one day going to judge us. These idols will draw us away from serving God. We don't have to bow down to a golden calf to be worshiping an idol in our heart. And when we start thinking about that golden calf, we don't have a golden calf in front of us, but there are things that we can put in our hearts that become idols or idols in our lives and make us idolaters. And the Bible condemns that. We understand, though, that the Bible heart is not this blood-pumping part of our body. It's interesting that when people uh, in their lives start talking about uh, their heart, oh, I know what I feel in my heart, and they're clutching their chest where their physical heart beats. That's not what it's talking about. We know something's in our heart. And we're living by the faith of God in our heart. It's not this thing that pumps blood. It's the center of our reasoning and thinking abilities and our believing abilities. Our heart, physical heart, doesn't believe something. This physical heart doesn't convict us of something. It's our mind. It's what the Bible is referring to as the heart, the Bible heart. As a matter of fact, if you look over... Like I said last week, you have to love technology. Doesn't seem like anything wants to work right today. Let's go over to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 4. And look at verse 23. In Proverbs 4, 23, the Bible reads, Keep thine heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep our heart with all diligence. It's not the old blood-pumping physical heart that pumps the blood through the body. It's our reasoning and thinking ability. So we need to understand this through our reasoning and what we believe is what's in our heart. And we have to make sure that as we live and as we serve God and do His will, that we're doing it according to what that will teaches us. Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, the Bible teaches us, For the heart... Man believeth unto righteousness, 
and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's with a heart we believe to righteousness. It's through our central mind and thinking abilities that causes us to be convicted of our sins and want to change, and it causes us to want to do what God's will teaches us to do through his Bible, and we change our heart and serve him, not the things of this world. But you look at our world today and the way they think, the world thinks whatever you want to do is fine. It doesn't matter what the Bible or anything else or anybody else tells you. But what is an idol? An idol is an image or a representation of a deity which is made and used as an object of worship. An idol also may be an object of passion. Anything that we place above God in worth becomes an idol. Whether we realize it or not, in our lives, we're worshiping that particular thing. So today in our lesson, we want to look at some various things that can become idols in our lives. You realize that our possessions can become idols? And we need to understand that we don't have to have a lot of possessions to make something our idol. It could be the richest person that lives on this earth that has a million or a billion dollar idol or a person living in a very small house with not a lot of money, not a lot of nice things, they can still make something in their lives an idol. So we have to understand that an idol is anything that we put in our lives, whether we possess a lot of things or not, but our possessions can become our idols. We may have that favorite car that we just baby all the time and we're always doing something with it and we put all of our attention on that car and we don't think about God. Every waking moment we're doing something to that car, but we don't take time to study the Bible. It could be, I like guns, could be a gun. You could have that favorite gun and that's the one you want to baby and polish up and then go out and shoot it and come back and polish it up again and clean it all up and put it up for a minute and then you want to go, oh, this is my baby. Some people are like that. I like my guns, but I'm not going to make them my idol. I like cars. I'm not going to make it my idol. But people can do that. You can do it with just about anything. It's all in the way people think about things. And we need to realize that we don't need to make things of this life our idols, especially our possessions. Let's look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Our life is not consisting of what we possess. This tells us that possessions are secondary. Our life and our service to God is the most important thing that we have and can do and can be in this life. Not our possessions. And what we have is not who we're supposed to be. But some people are like that. They make their possessions their idols. We need to understand our life has never been measured by what we possess. Neither is our faithfulness to the Lord measured by what we possess. Over Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 23, we have the rich young ruler. And he says, When he's gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled, kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? That's a great question. Anyone who has that opportunity to read instead of their Bible or hear someone teach the truth of God's Word and they come and ask them, what can I do to inherit eternal life? The age-old question, what can I do to be saved? And this young man came to Jesus. And Jesus answered him. And he said, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Defraud not, honor thy father and thy mother. The young man answered him and said, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, and sell whatsoever thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and take thy, up thy cross and follow me. 
Now notice Jesus gave him something to do. We know from other passages, Matthew's account tells us he was a rich young man. He was also a ruler. So we refer to him after reading all the accounts about this, that he was a rich young ruler. <clears throat> he had a lot of power and a lot of money. And Jesus says, you want to inherit eternal life? You want to go to heaven? Sell everything you have, give to the poor, or take up your cross and come follow me. Be one of my followers. But notice the next verse. After Jesus said all these things to him, verse 22, and he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had many possessions. He allowed his possessions to control his life. And because of allowing those possessions to control his life, he lost heaven. There's nothing in the Bible that tells us that that man ever came back and was converted. We cannot let possessions rule and control us. Then there are those who allow popularity to become their idols. There are many people who have sold their souls to be popular. There are some people, their greatest goal in life is to be popular with everyone. There are many parents who have sold their children's soul for popularity. You see it, I saw it growing up where there are those certain kids, they had to be the popular kids in school. They had to be in the in crowd. They had to have this and had to do that. And their parents pushed them. It's sad that some parents, not only in this and another point I'm going to look at later in the lesson, that some parents push their kids to the point that they want them to, to enjoy life so much that they don't think about God in the Bible. They want their kids to be the popular kids in the school. They don't worry about what the Bible teaches about life. They should live in humility. They teach their kids to be arrogant, prideful, sometimes bullies, so they can be the popular people in the school. Or even as they become adults, the popular people at work. And you have these kids that are being pushed by their parents, and they grow up to be that same kind of person, and they teach their kids, and that cycle doesn't end a lot of times. There's nothing wrong with being popular. But some people push their lives to the point of popularity to make sure everybody sees them. Look at me. Look at what I've got, or look at what I can do, or look who I am. I'm the popular person in school, or I'm the popular person at work that they're willing to give their souls for that. And that's a shame. Popularity, for a lot of people, costs too great a price. Too many people in this life are ser searching and seeking for popularity over a life and a service to God. We can see some of those in Jesus' day like that. In John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43, it says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Notice this last verse. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Those are two of the saddest verses you can, that you can read in the Bible. Because... You had chief rulers of the synagogue, Jews, that believed that Jesus Christ was a son of God and they knew who he was and they knew they needed to obey him. But they were afraid if they did do that, that the Pharisees would kick him out of the temple. And they had some chief seats. They had some popularity in the temple. And they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They were afraid what might happen to them. Oh, we don't want to be kicked out of the temple. We'll lose our popularity. We'll lose what we've got here. But in the long run, they lost God. And that's the saddest thing that could happen. We should never have the want of popularity to override our responsibility to God and serving and obeying Him. Serving God may cause us to be unpopular, but we need to remember that the Lord is with us, regardless of our friends, family, co-workers, or anybody else in this world is with or for us. We should never 
in our lives be ashamed of the gospel. Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Then as we go on, we see that position in life, in business, in work, or in family becomes some people's idol. Some people think that position in this life is more important than serving God. Over in the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, Paul wrote the Galatians, and in this, you're going to see that here's an apostle. Paul confronts another apostle, Peter, for hypocrisy. And this is an instance where we see that Peter was a hypocrite. He may have been a great apostle of God, or of Jesus Christ. He may have been doing the Lord's will in many things. He may have been winning souls to Christ. Yet in this instance, as we read in the book of Galatians, he was at fault for something he did. He played the hypocrite. In Galatians 2, beginning verse 11, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, Paul is saying, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with, the, with their dissimulation. So Paul is saying, when I came to Antioch, I stood up against uh, Peter to his face. He confronted him to his face in public in front of others. He said, because he was to be blamed. Peter was wrong in what he did. Well, what did Peter do? The very next verse tells us that before certain came from James, certain other Jews came, he was eating with the Gentiles because Peter knew that the Gentiles were worthy of salvation and he knew that these Gentiles who obeyed the gospel were saved and he was eating with some of these people. And yet when some other Jews came along, he withdrew himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid the Jews might say, why are you eating these Gentiles? You have some of these Judaizing teachers that Ken talked about this morning in the Bible class that they were requiring when a person became a Christian, they had to keep the law of Moses and even required circumcision among the men who obeyed the gospel. See, they were trying to go back to that old law and keep all of that when the gospel had already been put in place and you have some of these things happening in the book of Galatians, and Peter has, or Paul rather, has to deal with the issue, and it's bad enough he has to deal with it among people who call themselves Christians, but he had to confront a fellow apostle for what he did. So it tells us even apostles could fall into this temptation because one did. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Wherefore let him think he stand, take heed lest he fall. Don't become so prideful and arrogant and in our lives that we say oh I can never fall I'll never do that the old saying I heard growing up is never say never you have to be careful because some people may not intentionally just say hey here's a sin I'm going to go do this well we also read about those who were in Galatians 6 overtaken in a fault it means it may not have been something they were planning on doing. They didn't look and say, ooh, let me go do this. I know it's wrong. I'm going to do it anyway. But they let their guard down, and maybe with friends, could have been family, could have been co-workers, wherever it was. Brethren can be overtaken in a fault. Have you ever been driving down an interstate or nowadays even back road, and you're driving along, minding your business, somebody comes around you like you're sitting still and like they got jet engines on the back of the car, just, phew, they overtook you. That's what it's talking about. Somebody overtakes you when they pass you on the road. And you didn't see it coming. You didn't realize they were there until they come zipping around you. See, some people may think they're going down the uh, pathway of righteousness and they let somebody influence them to do wrong. And before you know it, they're already in it and overtaken in it. And say, wait a minute, why would I do this? Now they go ahead and do it. And at that point, they're conscious of what they're doing, but they're overtaken in the fault. And maybe in what happened to Peter. But it's still not right. We have to take heed lest we fall. 
Again, going back to John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. The Jewish leaders of that day who believed in Jesus and believed he was the Son of God but just didn't obey him, they loved their position more than they loved the truth of God's Word. I fear we have some in the church like that today. And we have to be careful and that it doesn't happen to us and encourage our brethren that if we see them going down that pathway, to encourage them to change, to help them see the error of their way as Paul did with Peter. But then as we move on, there are times that people make recreation their idol. And if we're not careful, we can do the same thing in our lives. We can make recreation our idol. As a matter of fact, this seems to be the new religion of the day for so many people. They have the mentality, let me serve me first and then I'll give something to God if I have time. That's the attitude that so many people are having today. I find it interesting in the summertime, we live up near Lake Conroe and there's a section of the lake that they have a little beach area. In the summertime, that thing is so full it looks like ants crawling. Where are they when it comes to worshiping God? Oh, we ain't got time for that. We've got to get on the lake. Boats zipping up around the lake all over the place. You get in some areas of that lake, you can look, and it's almost like ants in the water, so many boats. Oh, that's their God. That's their idol. That's what they would rather do than worship God. Sadly, I've seen those who call themselves Christians doing the same thing. I may have mentioned this in a lesson in the past, but when I was preaching in Alabama, we had one of our song leaders didn't show up for worship one day. I started asking where he was when the elder said, look at the newspaper. They had a big golf tournament coming up that was taking place that day. And when he came back, we confronted him and said, why would you miss worship for golf? Oh, well, that was my tea time. I was in this golf tournament. So you put golf over God? Well, you know it doesn't happen very often, but you know, I had to go do that. No, he didn't have to. He wanted to. He chose to. And he chose to forsake the worship of God and put a golf game ahead of God. What's more important? Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's not seek ye first the kingdom of God unless there's a golf game, unless there's a football game. Oh, we've got Super Bowl. Super Bowl's tonight. I remember growing up, and I thought it was funny growing up, looking back now, it's sad. But we had a few men at the congregation where I grew up that would bring little transistor radios and hide them in their suit pockets and stick their little earbud in their ear and would sit over like this so they could at least listen to the Super Bowl while we're in worship. They might as well stay at home watching on TV because they didn't care about what was going on in the building. They were warming a pew. Their heart was not there. Their heart was in that football game. And I remember listening to my dad fuss about it. Oh, so-and-so brought his little radio, and, and he should have been doing that. We're in worship. And I was a little fella. I was eight, nine years old. I was sticking and saying, oh, he got to listen to the ball game. But that's what a little eight or nine-year-old would think. But an adult would say, no, you shouldn't be doing that. You might as well just stay at home. Didn't get anything out of the worship. That becomes an idol, and that's what we're talking about. Now, I mentioned this earlier on the popularity, but there are parents that do the same thing with their children when it comes to recreation and sports. Oh, my kid's in sports. They've got to play the ball game. We've got a ball game on Sunday. God will understand. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. When people, if we could ever get Matthew 6, 33 etched in our brain enough, some people will never get it put in there. They would realize that popularity, possessions, they realize that recreation and other things cannot come before God. That's first. And yet a lot of people will do just the opposite. A lot of people look at it as a party. Let's just go party. Let's go have fun. Let's play. Well, we have such an instance in Exodus 32, verse 6. The first five verses tell us about Moses was up in the mountain receiving the commandments of God and the people said, well, what's happened to Moses? It's been a while. He hasn't come down. Uh, we need something to do. We need to worship something or somebody. 
And Aaron said, bring all your rings and give them to me. And he threw them in the pot and melted them all down and he fashioned a golden calf. And verse 6 said, and they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Their heart wasn't where it should be. But they wanted some recreation after they worshipped that golden calf. They rose up and partied. Some people care more about fun and games than the Lord. And others try to just bring the fun and games to the church. You look at how a lot of churches are, are doing today. How do they get people into the building? Oh, we've got basketball courts. We've got a baseball field. We've got all these things that you can have fun doing. Let's have a big old party. And they turn the worship into a party. I've got on YouTube and even Facebook, some churches will post things. I saw a VBS of a, of a church in our area. That folks, all it was was one big old hooping and hollering and yelling party. Where was a study of the Bible? Where was the soberness that the Bible teaches us that we're to have when we worship God? Where is, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 14, 40, let all things be done decently in order when it comes to worship? Not let's have all the stage lights flashing and blinking and all kind of stuff going on and people in the aisles dancing and jumping up and down and hooping and hollering, oh, praise the Lord, yeah, 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 like a football game. Where does the Bible teach that? It doesn't. And yet that's what we see in a lot of worship in a lot of churches today. They care more about the fun and the games, or more about the hype. They hype it up. They get on, they call it a spiritual high. We're not on spiritual crack, folks. Not spiritual meth or even spiritual marijuana. It's doing what God said, the way he said to do it. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And yet people add to that every day. In Luke 15, the prodigal son, when he wanted all of his possessions, his inheritance from his father before his father died, you know, it don't normally work that way. You have, your parents may have a will and they say we're going to leave this, this, this to this one, this, this, this to that one and on down the line. Well this son came to his father before his father even died. He said I want my inheritance now. And it tells us in Luke 15, 13 that he went into a faraway country and wasted his substance on riotous living. You know what riotous living is? It didn't mean like riots like we see today. People blocking the road and breaking windows and burning buildings down. It meant good old fashioned partying. He was just partying. He went and wasted on all kind of party and fun times. Matter of fact, when he came back, the older brother was mad and the older brother had a wrong attitude. At least the younger brother was penitent and came back and asked for forgiveness. But the older brother did say, he wasted your, su your substance, Father, on harlots. So he was partying. Whatever means and things he could and whatever he wanted to do, he was wasting it rather than doing what he should have done with it and taking care of it. See, this young man was carried away with fun and games to the extreme. But next, there are those who can make their career an idol. We know that our career is important. Nobody discounts that because the Bible says if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. The Bible teaches against laziness. So get a job and work. Earn a living for your family and serve God faithfully. But some people put their careers ahead of God. In Luke chapter 14, verses 16 through 19, we read, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. And he sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I need to go see it. I pray have me excused. Another said, I brought, bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife and can't come. Look at these flimsy excuses, particularly the first two. I bought a piece of ground. I need to go look at my land I bought. Now, is that land going to jump up and move somewhere? 
He's going to go the next day and the land's gone. Whoa, what happened to it? There's nothing but a big hole in the earth. My land's gone. Another said, oh, I bought five yoke of oxen. I've got to go check out my oxen. I need to test them out. I can't come. He bid a great supper. Very likely it could have been daytime or could have been evening time. But you don't think there's time in the day to go do that? He could have done it earlier or he could have done it the next day. If you look at this, all of these are excuses. There is no reason for a person who bought land, if he hadn't already seen the land, and too many people won't buy land sight unseen, but let's say he even bought it sight unseen. Was it that imperative life or death he had to go right then to look at his land? It's going to be there tomorrow as long as you wake up tomorrow. And if it doesn't, what does it matter? Because if you go look at it today and die tomorrow, you're still dead and you didn't get any use out of it. If you live tomorrow, you at least can go look at it tomorrow. If you have oxen, let them stay in the stalls or in the field or wherever you put them, and you can go try them out tomorrow. But these people didn't want to come to the supper because they had other things in mind. Oh, I've got to work. You know, these, these oxen, they, they're not going to just stand around. I've got to work them. So he is putting a career or putting his work ahead of things that were more important. The invitation by a master to a great supper is a privilege and honor to have been invited to such a meal. And yet, because of his lack of care and concern for what was better, he decided, I need to go work today in the fields. I need to go work my oxen. I've, I've got work I need to do. Well, that work can be put off to tomorrow if you've got some other engagement that's more important. There are some things that are a lot more important than business Matter of fact, there's a lot of things that are a lot more important than business. And we've got to work the business, whether we own a business or whether we're an employee. We're uh, required by that employer, or if we are owning the business, we're still required to make sure we keep our business going. But we cannot do that to the detriment of our soul. We cannot put that ahead of God. Yet a lot of people do. Again, Matthew chapter 6 Verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Next, there are those in this life who will put fitness and their physical fitness above everything else and it can become an idol. I know a lot of people who enjoy going to the gym. I know Jonathan does that quite often. A lot of people do. And as long as we're keeping in mind our responsibilities to God, is there anything wrong with being physically fit? No, we should be physically fit if we can. And we take the opportunity to keep our bodies in good shape. It helps us live longer, very possibly. But there are some people who all they do is live in the gym or you see them out running all the time and that becomes their idol. Physical fitness is a God-approved attribute. But we know there are other things that are equally important. In 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, it says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profited little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of life that now is, and of that which is to come. He's not saying there's anything wrong with physical fitness. He's saying there's a place for it, but don't put that first in your life. It profits a little. It gets you physically fit, but godliness is profitable in all things. Our shift yesterday, well, no, Friday, all were eating, and there a guy, the guy came up. We were getting ready to leave. One of the guys poked me and said, man, look at that guy. He's one of these guys you call a no-neck guy. He's got so many muscles you can't even see his neck. His neck's, neck is even one big old huge muscle. And up here in his shoulders are so big it comes up like that, and he's walking around like this because he, he's so huge. Nothing wrong with that per se. But if that's all you do, and usually people like that, that's about all they do. They'll work and go to work out and don't worry about God. Oh, I got to go to the gym even on Sunday because can't miss a day. Got leg day today. Got arm day today. I've got to do something. 
we need to realize that there are things that are more important. And that's the Word of God. Finally, in many people's lives, their desires become their idol. Man never ceases to desire the things he sees. We'll look at things that, oh, I'd like to have that. There's nothing necessarily wrong with saying, oh, I'd like to have that. But if we obsess on it, that becomes all we think about and all we want and all we do. And we're going to do whatever it takes to get it, whether it's ethical, unethical, illegal, or illegal. I'm going to get that. We're coveting something. And that's what covetousness is. And that's what the Bible condemns. And in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, in the lust of the flesh, that, and we're not going to go through that whole list, but he tells all the things that people lust after in the flesh that are desires of the heart. And those lusts of the flesh fulfills those desires. They're fleshly desires just like many idols are. And we have to be careful. Because of personal lust, men then and now look for others to approve their, their actions. And they'll say, oh, don't you think that would be good? Don't you think I need to do this? Or I need to have this? I need to get this? And they're thinking about all their desires, their wants. They're not thinking about well, what can I do to help other people or what can I do to be a better servant of God. As we close this morning and go back thinking about what we've been talking about, setting up idols in the heart is just as serious as setting up a physical idol in front of us to bow down and worship. We don't have to have something made of wood, stone, or precious metal to make it an idol. Idolatry in our heart is just as bad. And idolatry is still one of the things that, that displeases God. And it's something that when tempted, we have to fight Satan not to give in to that temptation. And we have the means to do it with God's word. And if we obey God and follow his word and do his will and overcome those temptations, then heaven will be our home one day. As a child of God, if you're here and you're not faithful, haven't been doing God's will, why not come back to God and ask for forgiveness? If you set up idols in your heart by doing or wanting or giving in to things just because it feels good, looks good, and it makes you popular, then put those things behind you. Repent of your sins, confess them, and pray for the forgiveness of them. If you're not a child of God, don't let idols in this life continue to cause you to lose your soul because if you're not a child of God, you're lost right now. You're either a Christian, a servant of God, or a servant of the devil. Can't be both. It's one or the other. And if you're not a Christian, you can come today with all your heart believing in Jesus as a son of God changing your life in repentance, turning away from sin and turning to God, making the confession in your life with your mouth that I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and upon that confession, uh, be immersed in baptism for the remission of your sins. The Lord will add you to his church as you put him on in baptism. He'll save you, and your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And as you live a faithful Christian life and draw your final breath, you can have heaven as your eternal home. If you're subject in any way to the Lord's invitation, come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing?